Okay, here we go. We've been waiting for that all day. And hey, guys. Wait, hold on. <laughs> and <laughs> oh, my you're God. coming off here. It's off the rails. It's off the rails. It's, it's episode 102. Woo! Welcome to CMD Towers, Brews, and Builds. I'm Mr. Comet number five, and my fellow host, similar to Jon Snow, he knows nothing. Big Tuck. How dare you? Uh, but not far from the not far from the truth. Hey, snake elves and scouts out there. Three relevant creature types that we'll be talking about shortly. Uh, I am Big Tuck. I am excited. I got a big weekend planned, but Mr. Combo, I want. I thought we could take a quick second and Ooh, do a little right. CMD Tower truck talk. Truck talk. Truck talk. All right. So Are I, you going to ask me to drive to North Carolina and help you move? Because that's a no. Yes. Uh, well, you got the pickup now, right? I need you to move. The, I need you to schlep this couch that doesn't fit in an <laughs> elevator. Uh, no. I. So I went. I'm do. I'm going camping this weekend up at Lake James. And I got a Ooh, new piece right. of wood for the back of the Forerunner. But as we were talking about offcast, I had to wait 20 minutes to get it cut. And turns out that I didn't even need all of it. So I left a bunch of it there in the parking lot, which I feel terrible about. But so whoever is at the parking lot in West Charlotte, congratulations. You got uh, you got a quarter cut panel of three quarter inch plywood, and then also a mostly broken piece of what I can only assume is eighth inch plywood that my dad dug up from his house. Oh, also uh, big, big news in dad town. I like this. I really like this bit last week, so I'm going to do it again. Now uh, you, what do you remember what my dad looked like last time you saw him? I mean, uh, I've seen a picture of him since the last time I physically saw him. So I saw the beard. Okay. So evidently, he finally got vaccinated. Check your phone. Oh my god! <laughs> right? I think he looks like John Ham. I mean, an older, wearied John Ham. But yes, uh, he, was, he does have. He does, he does look like he belongs in the Mad Men era. Yes, uh, he was just with my cousins out in Maine all week. So yes, he was. He has been world wearied. But that's that's what's new in my world. I'm looking forward to getting out in the uh, up in the mountains. How about yourself? Do you have any truck talk or? Oh, wait, yes, you do. Just today, you're hauling it. I bet it was a smooth... Oh, that's technically true. Uh, I went and bought a seven cubic foot uh, deep freezer chest for the basement uh, because we actually have our dogs on like this fresh dog food that they send every two-ish weeks. And uh, we, we have a side-by-side -side fridge right now. And I mean, it's a decent size, sure. but the dog food alone takes up like 50% of the freezer. Uh, and so we just like didn't have any room for other stuff. So oh, I was like... Sure. And, you know, they had another shipment get delivered today. I was putting stuff in there and having to throw away popsicles, take ice packs out, try to, like, move meat from the freezer to the fridge. And I was just like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to spend a couple hundred dollars, get a deep freezer. Sure. I remember my parents used one when I was growing up, and it always seemed like there was a use for it. So uh, the godfather uh, went with me to Lowe's to go get one. And I thought I was going to need help picking it up because a deep freezer sounds heavy. Uh, yes. I don't know anyone who's just like, I'll pick up a fridge. Yeah, just do it by myself. So uh, we get it. We get out to the truck, go to put it in the truck. Tuck, I lifted this thing by myself. <laughs> it weighed now, to absolutely be, to nothing. To be fair, you now, to be fair, you are also a big, strong man. <laughs> I mean, I guess. But even the Godfather, who is just a tall, lanky man, yes. was like, I'm disappointed. I feel like they sold you Kansas Air, and there's not actually there's a not deep anything freezer in, in the this box. box. Yes. Uh, confirmed there is a deep freezer in the box. So, and I also, um, I was thinking about this because we were just chat, we were just catching up uh, before we started the show here. I'm kind of surprised you didn't have one already, like with the amount that you cook and grill and everything. So it's, it's high time. I was actually this close, Tuck. Uh, so this fridge was two hundred and thirty dollars. They had an open I or freezer. They had an open item stainless steel fridge, Ooh. top freezer, bottom fridge for four hundred and fifty dollars. And originally it was like nine seventy or nine. And you just just as like a backup fridge that you put in the basement. Well, I thought about doing that instead of the deep freezer because really the whole point of me getting this deep freezer get a lot of the dog food out. But then yeah, it'd be nice to do other stuff. And I was like. And the Godfather talked me out of it. He's like, how often are you actually going to use the fridge? You already have a beer right. fridge. And yeah. it's like, that's a fair point. I think the only time it would ever come in handy is like big group events type stuff like what we're doing tomorrow um, just to have an extra fridge. But I think the freezer space will probably get used more. Yeah. You know, see ribs on sale, a brisket on sale. Ex exactly. Bud. 
exactly and just put it away plus all your chicken nuggets and all that other stuff you like in the air fryer so yeah, there you well, go. Uh, win, win. my fiance will uh, probably go buy 30 bags of chicken nuggets and I will <laughs> now need to get another deep freezer to actually use it for what I need it. <laughs> well, guys, if you'd like to support us financially um, and help keep the lights on, help us keep upgrading our equipment, you should head over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash CMD Tower. Uh, we have many different pledge levels, anywhere from a dollar to five to 15 to 25 a month. And all of them come with a myriad of uh, little perks, it could be the RK post sign tokens that we send out. It could be our own uh, logoed playmat sleeves, reminder tokens, coin, crap, deck therapy, Discord access. I mean, yep. literally just head to the website. You can see all the ones. We really do appreciate it. And we're still, we've been saying this for like a year. We are so close. We need to get like over this proverbial hump. So we can finally <laughs> get to the number 50. So that way we can start having you guys on the cast as well. Now, we do have a referral program, so if you are an existing patron, uh, anyone that you refer to join the collective, whether it's a dollar, five, fifteen, or twenty-five, have them message us on Patreon, and we'll send you something free. You know, just, you know, hey, if it was the, the dollar tier to join the Discord, we will sign a card for you. Uh, if it was the five dollar, we'll maybe, you know, send you a pack of sleeves. I mean, it just really kind of depends, uh, but we will hook you up for constantly promoting us. Now, if you can't help out from a monthly perspective, but you would like to get some of the swag, or maybe you're an existing supporter and you need to get extras for whether it be birthdays or Christmases, uh, head over to our store, cmdtower.com slash merch. We do sell everything on there. There's a redacted bit that has been redacted, so therefore I'm not allowed to talk about it. Well done, well uh, done. Good call, good save. And, and, and moving on from there. And then, of course, uh, there's another redacted bit. Every episode, redacted bit. Music, redacted bit. And then, uh, of course, we got to give a big shout out to our audio producer, Squee McGee, at Dear Squee on Twitter. He does have a full studio. Uh, if you ever do come in the Kansas City metro area, you can do some in-session recordings. But even if you just need him to do some audio editing, whether it be your religious group, it could be a cl another club that you're a part of. Another uh, cult, sure. Another cult, absolutely. I'd like to thank all of our cult members in the collective, only are a part of us, but... Um, I think all of us cult leaders feel the same way. Yes. So definitely hit up him, but his preferred way is DeerSquee at cmdtower.com. Now our video editor, got a big shout out for Tyler at underscore Teacoats. Uh, he does video editing for a lot of different magic content creators out there on YouTube. Please comment and let us know how we can constantly improve this cast so that way uh, uh, we know what you guys want. Because without your feedback, we have zero clue. Correct. So Brews and Builds is our deck tech series. Since we conquered the path to 32, tackled tons of EDH themes, we're gonna be discussing, or rather, theory crafting a Bum. deck that doesn't even exist yet. What? You mean like what Ooh. all the other content creators do? Yeah, but we're cooler. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because we're, we'll we're running out of decks to talk about, literally. <laughs> <laughs> Season each month will consist of new decks. We correlate how these decks are constructed similar to how beer is brewed. So we broke it down into four different categories. The first one's ramp and setting your board state. That's grain. Yes, and the grains are foundations of every beer. They include both base malts and specialty malts, usually about a 60 to 40 ratio. This helps with the color, the taste, and most importantly, the alcohol content of the beer. Decks always need ways to grow, stabilize, and ramp into bigger threats. And just like a grain profile, they're usually a mix of staples and specialty cards. Then it's how does your board interact with all of your opponents? We call that hops. And hops give the beer its patented bitterness and herbal floral flavors. They're grown in a variety of strands, help distinguish with subcategories like this delicious freak of nature, double India pale ale from our Whoa. pals up at Wicked Weed Brewing. Uh, an unusual, unexpected natural phenomenon, an outlying West Coast style double IPA brewed with an abnormally large quantity of hops, uh, similar to this deck. A delicately crafted and crushable ale designed for fresh and immediate consumption. Our hop choices <laughs> help clear and interact with the board so your deck can do what it wants. And then one of my favorite sections, how does the deck close out or win games, which uh, we're getting a little sweaty this yes. episode. Uh, we call that yeast. I can only imagine. And yeast are living microorganisms that eat the sugar from the grain and poop out alcohol and CO2. That's alcohol content and the carbonation. Without yeast, we be drinking flat sugar water. Without yeast cards, your deck would meet the goal of actually winning the game. And then a very fun section, spice, which is kind of weird to do when you're theory crafting a deck, but uh, it's all right. I got a good one. I got a great one, and I'm so glad because it's an expensive card that I have literally no other purpose for. 
Uh, and not, oh. every di- not every beer has them, but spices and other additives help separate a normal stock beer from a specialty one. It could be the pepper that turns a stout into a jalapeno stout or the addition of large quantity of hops that turn this into a double IPA. Not every deck has something that makes it pop, but if it does, is where we generally talk about it. So without further ado, guys, let's get brewing. Let's get theorying. Yeah, for the inaugural theory crafting episode, we thought it would only be fair to give the runner up to the inaugural draft (laughs) some time to shine. Plus, Big Tug actually wants to build this in paper. Lonus Cryptozoologist. Crypto. So think of it like cryptocurrency. And then zoo. And then like you've seen, uh, you've seen, uh, what's it called? Jumanji, the new one, right? Uh, with Kevin so. Hart and The Rock? I think I saw Kevin- the original one. I haven't seen the sequel. Oh, okay. Well, anyways, Kevin Hart's character is a zoologist, and it's some and he's always bitching about why his class is so underpowered. And then in the end, he comes out of nowhere riding an elephant into like this RV and just goes, Zoologist bitch! So there you go. So this is <laughs> this is Lana's crypto zoologist bitch. Uh, a new Simic commander. It costs a uh, Simic on the nose. It's a green and a blue. Legendary creature, snake, elf, of course. Scout, couldn't have been anything else because uh, we're in Simic, of course. Uh, it's a one, two. So the main thing I like about it is its first ability. Whenever another non-token creature enters a battlefield under your control, investigate. Uh, if anyone anyone knows how much I love the Monarch, I love me a off-forgotten and unabusable uh, theme and everword ability. And then ta- and also investigate is you create a clue token. Um, and then he has a, it, she, I think it's a she, has a second ability, uh, tap, sacrifice, X clues. Target opponent reveals the top X cards of their library. You may put a non-land permanent card, with mana value X or less from among them onto the battlefield under your control. That player puts the rest of the bottom of their library in a random order. So uh, before I got a little, I actually sat down, put fingers to keyboard and wrote out a little kind of, Little kind of description here. So, <clears throat> without further ado, for this theory craft, I chose to replace my current Simic deck, Edric Spy Master of Trust. Uh, as I've had it for so long, I think it was my third or fourth deck I've ever built. I've also played it so many times, it pretty much like wins or loses in the same vein every time. Totally fine deck, but just kind of got a little, little long in the tooth for me. So, I'm hoping that with Mr. Combo's help, I'll be able to craft a brand new mid range deck that can be a huge value engine and ramp in some big late game finishers. Uh, this is what I sent Mr. Combo to work on, and uh, we will also be choosing. We have also chose what three grains, three hops, and then maybe some multi-card combinations for the yeast. And then I chose a spice. Um, I chose a. Uh, uh, what did I do? I did a single spice as well. Excellent. So uh, this is what I sent over to him. Lana's cryptozoologist struck me as an interesting Simic commander, especially considering the other recent objects. Obj- black. <laughs> Especially considering, <laughs> I also just want to know what's funny. I really, I literally just realized that this is the first time I think I spoke the entire day. <laughs> I don't think I've, I don't think I've talked since the, now. Uh, especially considering the other re- recent options that have come out, all of which are focused way more around lands and generic Simic value engines. After seeing a similar deck build, and I quote IRL on Tuesday, I hope we can go one of three ways with this deck. One, heavily lean into the investigate mechanic, generating clues as well as some food and treasure tokens. Uh, two, play high value, efficient, and impactful enter the battlefield. Creatures will be able to bounce occasionally. And then finally, close out the game with some big hitter artifact and artifact synergies, playing into the clues generated from my investigation. So on the surface, Mr. Combo, I know some people when this got spoiled were pretty excited about it. Um, how have you felt about, well, how do you feel about going into this? Uh, I'm going to be honest. I'm. Are you going to be it, Mr. Combo? I'm going to be Booyah! Mr. Combo. Uh, it, it's not my cup of tea. Um, it, it seems interesting that you can kind of like theft from your opponents to an extent. Sure. Like that's, that's pretty cool, but you know how I feel about relying on your opponents to mm-hmm. kind of win the game. And that's where it's like, if you're, if you're using Lonus on its face for what she does, I don't think it's going to be that it's, great. It's it's, it's, it's very, a little sli- it's a little slimy. It's a little sweaty, right? It's very much how we did the deck therapy episode with Magda earlier in the mm. week, to where it's like I can kind of see what you're doing, but really your commander is just generic value, and you kind of have to have the rest of the deck built up right, to really right, make right. it work. But Lonus is weird to where she doesn't care about your deck. She cares about your opponent's decks, right? So, right, right. right. Um, I'll, I'll be interested to see. What ends up happening once we get to the end of this episode? 
Um, I like that it's low CMC. That's great. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I do like that you have a generic ETB effect. Very few people play your. Um, it's not silence, but um, uh, torpor orbs of the world. Yeah, torpor orbs of the world. Yeah. Very few people actually do that. And uh, if we know anything about Simic, there's ways to blink stuff and do ridiculous mm -hmm. shenanigans. So I could see you making like a crap ton of clues. It's just like, what are what are we going to do once we get those clues? And hopefully we figure that out. Ooh, indeed. Uh, I can't really talk about the color distribution or the CMC, but since it's in Simic, it's probably likely going to be low. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, let's start off and move to the rant and grain section. Uh, Big Tuck, being this your fake deck, why don't you go ahead and start us off with your very first grain? Sure. So I, I the the grains are a lot of leaning into the investigation, right? Um, one thing that I think people forget about clues because they're kind of a forgotten artifact, but they do yeah. actually like draw you cards, right? Like they do kind of replace themselves and that sort of thing. Um, so one card that came to mind immediately that I've always been looking for a home for, but just never quite figured it out. Uh, and a lot of these are from the plane of Innistrad. So God knows if we're going to have to replace half of these in six months. Uh, but I want to talk about an enchantment called Uvenwald Mysteries. Ooh, and that is, in fact, right. Uvenwald. Uh, so two colors and a green will get you an enchantment that says, whenever a non-token creature you control dies, investigate. Um, and then whenever you sacrifice a clue, create a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token. So I'm playing a lot of these low-to-ground creatures that kind of come in, do their thing, and then are done, right? Maybe they have yeah. Death Touch, or maybe they are blockers. But in comparison to Edric where all my low to the ground creatures are all very like evasive and are going to go through. I have a feeling that a lot of my creatures are going to die. So for me, it's like, <laughs> I might as well fair. get something out. Of, I might as well get something out of it. And then again, draw it's pain two to draw a card off a clue is okay. Right. Especially because you have a finite amount of them, but pain two drawing a card and creating a, a human soldier to me, it gives a lot more value into them. If you have to get down to the point where you have to start sacrificing these clues just to get into your next thing. Um, yeah. so that's, that's for me why I think this is like kind of a grain, kind of a hop, but definitely yeah. a, a good for the investigate part of the deck. Yeah, I like it. Um, you know, I'm always a, a fan of creating off color tokens in decks, <laughs> uh, making white and Simic. I love it. And yeah, it's very strange. Uh, and the nice thing is the way that that's worded is if you sack 10 clues, you're going to get 10 soldiers with your commander's exactly. ability. Uh, because that's that's usually the big negative to clues is you got to pay two mana and sacrifice it to draw a card. And so usually you don't have 20 mana lined up to sack all these clues. Right. But the fact that your commander, you sack however many you want, even if, you know, it may not be profitable because maybe you're at a point in the game where it's like, I just need blockers. I'll mm -hmm. sack all the clues that I've done for 15. Pick Mr. Combo because he's the only one I can pick. I know he has nothing in his deck that I want. I'm just looking for the 15 white human soldiers. It's Exactly right. So um, I like how it's worded that way. So it's not like when you sacrifice a clue and draw a card, it's pretty uh -huh. blonde there. And also like an artifact wipe would actually kind of be helpful, which we'll get into in the hops. So Mr. Combo, what is your first pick, sir? All right. So my first pick. Oh, and before that, did you find did, did, did you kind of build this into one of the three ways that we talked about or kind of a mix max of all of them? Was there one that kind of jumped out at you from like a strategy perspective? Um, I really kind of tried to lean in to the artifact side of it and okay, try to sure. figure out how, how can we leverage and use these clues to the best way possible? Because right. that's, I look at clues similar to energy. You gotta really, like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't half ass it. You have to really dedicate to it to make it work. And so totally. that's why a card that I'm actually running in my dungeon deck. I don't care what you say, Tree Folk Lord. I'm running it. I love it. <laughs> I know it's on your list, Tuck. It's an artifact. It's from Shadows Over Innistrad. It's a journal from Oh my Tamio. God, yes it is. Ready? Wait, here we go. Ready? Three, two, one. Tamio's Tamio Journal. Tamio's Journal. Woo! Five color list. Legendary artifact. Rare. Damn it. Uh, I have a lot to say about this, so I will happily read this. And don't worry... We are back. People have been begging for it. The wheel is back. I mean, have so, they been begging for it? I feel like it's a bit of a stretch. I, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> the Tamiyo Journal is a legendary artifact that comes down for five uh, colorless mana. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, investigate, and then tap, sack three clues, search your library for a card, then put that card into your hand, then shuffle. And uh, one thing that's kind of cool about this is that uh, this one happens to say entry 434. But in reality, each one of them says a different entry. 
So it, like if you look at four or five of these, it'll say entry, blah, blah, blah. And then the same thing every single time. That'll sound a little bit like this. <clears throat> and this is from our old pal, John Old, the mission naturalist. Now, if you look over on your left, you'll see entry 434, colon. There's more to Avison's madness, dot, dot, Oh, dot. my God. I Isn't he a have, handsome devil? <laughs> I have one in front of me, and it's entry 711. There's more to Avison's yeah. madness. That's so cool. There's a, there's a gazillion of them. So, yes. Oh, um, oh what? Uh, they actually show it. So Sorry, Tech. If any of you are curious, go to Scryfall. Go to Tamio's Journal's page oh. on the right side under Variations. There are five. Journal Entry 546, 653, 711, 855, 922, and then obviously 434. But what do the numbers mean? I'm sure some Nobody grognard knows. out there. Yeah, I know. Some idiot out there spent entirely too much time on Reddit trying to suss this one out. <laughs> uh, so why so, did you go with this one? I, I, okay, let's just go with the obvious. It's making clues. Yeah. Uh, there yep. we go. Uh, but the other reason I went with it, once again... Tuck is not a player that tries to put very, very high-powered tutors in the deck. Correct. But you will put high, high-powered creatures in a deck. You're all about big, stompy nonsense or Absolutely. some sort of political card. And so I think this will satisfy you and I's need. I like to have ways to be able to go get answers when I need them. You would like your deck to be a little bit slower but at the same time, you don't want to feel like you're pigeonholed and you can't get answers if you need it. So I think Tamio's journal's just slow enough in this deck to where you don't feel like you're tutoring every turn, but you could probably at least get it every other turn. And I think yeah. if you can have an every other turn tutor, that's worth it. Because usually Tamio's journal, guys, sucks because it's like four turns before you can do anything. Exactly. And uh, I, I was really hot on this card when it came out. I have since pretty much all but cooled off. I think I bought like 10 copies thinking yep. that this is going to be the next best tutor. <laughs> uh, I think uh, time has proven me wrong on that. But when I did play this, and there are a handful of cards, which we'll get to later, that are really, really strong in the deck. So having a kind of generic tutor to go get them at once a turn speed or once ever at instant speed for me fits both the bill and like the win con kind of of the deck. And it fits into your Ulvenweld mysteries where you're still sacking clues at right. mass effect, like I was talking about. He's not paying six mana to sack these three clues. You're paying nothing, just tapping the journal and tutoring, and you now get three exactly. one, one white human soldier trinket tokens. Exactly. That's a good one. All right. Tuck, what's your next one? All right. Or last one. This is it. This is it. Yes, this is my last one. This is another elf scout. Uh, it's not whatever snake or whatever the third is. Uh, this is another fresh one, and even though this doesn't necessarily give me a clue token, it still will feed into my later strategy. So brand new, about $2 now, Tireless Provisioner. Uh, oh, two colorless yes. and a green, yeah, it's insane, for an uncommon elf scout. So landfall, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, create a food token or a treasure token, and food is an artifact with two colorless tap, sacrifice this artifact, you gain three life, treasure obviously is tap, sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color. So as we'll get into the yeast section, I'm really trying to play into kind of these higher end artifact synergies. And a lot of them are around like the number of artifacts you control, the number of tokens you control, doing things with the artifacts you have. So even though this isn't necessarily an investigation into clue for the commander, I still think, and I, spoiler alert, people out there, I'm gonna choose treasure unless I'm about to die every single time. Like it just makes sense. So getting a bit of ramp that also- But Tuck, will you could run the Gilded Goose. No, so the actually, food. Okay. is that on? Is that on your list? Because that was no. dangerously close to mine. If that no. wasn't like a five dollar card, then I might think about it. Wow. Um, or maybe it use. Maybe it's come down. No, it's still five. Yeah, it's five bucks. So yeah, not buying that. Uh, get that. Get that. Get that. I mean, that was that was kind honky. of the pseudo birds of paradise and standard. Yes. Uh, get, you ready for this? Get that honk e out of here Ooh. uh so yeah so tireless provisioner i think you're gonna see this played a lot it's one of the it's like one of the chase on comments from modern horizon and feeds into everything else this deck is doing i have literally nothing else to add um simic is gonna play lands and not by normal land terms it's gonna do simic land things yeah um oh my gosh tuck tireless provisioner and renin seven with that zero Ooh. effect <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Um, and, so yeah. and you win. Yeah, and you win. Uh, so I think I think it makes absolute sense. And kind of like I talked about in the beginning, I, I leaned a little bit more with the artifact and clue piece, which 
this obviously feeds into the artifacts. So I think you're you and I are right in line with how we are ramping our deck. We'll just have to see if we agree on how we're going to interact with our opponents and Ooh. win. All right. All right, you got two you got two in a row ski. Wow me. I, I got two in a row skied, and I'm gonna go with the most boring one first. Doubling Okay. Skis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, four colorless green enchantment. If an effect would create one or more tokens under your control, you get that many. Uh, you get double. And if an effect would put one or more counters on a permanent you control, you do double. I actually would argue that doubling season's probably a Simic staple. Almost everything in Simic Oof. makes either tokens or counters or both. It's so... It's definitely... I will definitely agree to the point of a standard. It's really close to a staple for me. Um, but definite standard. Yeah, um, and so without going into ad nauseum, wink, wink, uh, on doubling season, we've already talked about it. The commander's making yeah. tokens. He has another thing making tokens. Yeah, uh, we we got the uh, tireless provisioner making tokens. I would be shocked if Tuck, when you're at the end of the day done building this deck, you don't have twenty individual cards that are making tokens. Oh, for sure. And yeah. so, it for me. Uh, Doubling Season is a great card. It's like a Mana Crypt, a Soul Ring. You kind of want right. to put it in any deck that does anything with tokens or counters. I do not go in that count, though, or that corner. I think you have to have a minimum number to really have it make mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, right. And I think as long as you're above 20 in this deck, you have a Doubling Season. We got one for you. Play test it over into this deck. It, exactly. I, I think you'll be fine. Yeah, uh, that's definitely coming in. I just need to get the Play Test varietals, although I did just get those of the Triomes. Because I'm not spending $30 for a deck I don't even know if I like. They're $30 for the Triomes? For if you want to get all of them. Oh, oh. If you okay. want to get all if you want to get all five, it's probably like $30 to $40, right? Oh, so they're like six, seven bucks a piece. Somewhere in that. But I think oh, a couple okay. of them are 10. So but for me, it's like I'm doing them for a new deck, which we may or may not be talking about sometime in the future. Sure. And I don't want to just spend that money to test on this deck and then figure out what to do with them. So All right. Well, here's I'm the one that it. I think is really fun. Also a Modern okay. Horizons 2 card. Of course. Cost three colorless. It's an artifact creature, assembly worker, academy manufacturer. Gotta uh, have this in here. <laughs> we, we will be talking about that later. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a rare, that it's a one three for about $4. If you would create a clue, a food, or a treasure token, you make one of each. Yeah, it's it's insane. And there's a little bit of, oh, Flavor? you got an easy one. Uh, our old pal, our old pal Jerry Seinfeld, coming in and telling us all about the systems at the Tolarian Academy. Well, listen here, guys. Automated <laughs> systems at the Tolarian Academy sort of new acquisitions for optimal use, determining which should be studied, eaten, or sold. That was dangerous. You're all three I think it was of your, almost Kramer. Your your Jerry, Harry, and Christopher Watkins all are dangerously close to each other. Hey, so, what can I say? Well, Maybe but, that's just telling us something. They're all the same person. Have you have uh, you seen that Family Guy sketch where it's like Ray Romano, Kermit the Frog, and somebody else, and no one knows who's talking? That's pretty funny. It's, it's, it's kind of that range. So, uh, you know, we already have Tyler's Provisioner in here. We have your Commander yeah. in here. We have the other. Well, the other one doesn't make. Uh, well, no, it does. Uh, it investigates. So I think if we go in, I think the the goal, if you had to tier it, number one should be clues and then food and treasures, like probably treasure than food. Yes. Yep. Um, but you're going to have that other stuff because you want the value and as Academy manufacturer. And honestly, Tuck, I don't if you don't buy it now for three sixty or three thirty. You're, it's probably going to be a ten or fifteen dollar card. Let, let, let me stop you there. As soon as this got spoiled, I got a full. I got the like full art version in foil. Just being like, I'm just gonna get out of the way. I'll spend my six dollars now or whatever. Because yeah, there's. I even playing on Bevers. I've seen one or maybe two decks. I don't remember. I remember one specifically that are built around this card. Like yeah. this is like the best card in the deck. Um, this card is going to be played a lot. It's insanely good. I'm kind of scared of it, and it's kind of also <laughs> insane. It's it's three for a one three. Right, it's it's so value. Yeah, this is straight value town gas. Straight value town gas. Well, we're gonna take this oh. gassy conversation uh, out of the grains and over to the hops. And <laughs> I will start this off with. Uh, so look, Tuck, I, I know you don't like counter spells. I get it. Oh boy. Oh wait, hold on. But this is a good one. <laughs> this is. It feeds into your commander because it is a non-token that can enter the battlefield at flash speed. So we are talking about the Mystic Snake. Oh, hell yeah. 
So colorless Same. green, blue, blue creature snake from M20 or uh, not M25. Would that be M25? That is M25. Master 25, yes. yeah. Master 25, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, M25 it, will come out in what, two, three years? Uh, I guess, oh wait, yes. they don't do state, I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> so it has flash and it states when Mystic Snake enters the battlefield, counter target spell and tuck. Who is the Mystic Snake? I'm not even going to spin the wheel because you know who this has to be. It's Angelina Jolie God from Beowulf, your favorite. Come on. It's on theme. It's sexy things snake. are in your flesh before it leaves your ears. Yeah, sex. see, but that's good. Yeah, it's sex. <laughs> so, Having sex uh, with Billy Bob Thornton but, in a car. So it, it is a overcosted counter spell. Totally right. get it. But I think, Tuck, the way that you like to pay... Hey, the way you like to play, is I think you would rather pay the additional colorless and green and also get your commander's effect, plus exactly. get a creature that you could use as a blocker versus saving that mana and just getting a plain old counter spell. I completely agree. And I think also that you're going to, when I build this deck, which I have the card list um, minus whatever we talk about here, um, I think you're going to see there's going to not be the hops package is going to be very light on spells and very heavy on creatures, right? Yep. Like creatures ETB in and doing something so that it could be blinked later and continue that value train going. I've always been a big fan of mystic snake. Um, would you ever run this in a deck? No. Okay. Yeah. I figured it's not. <laughs> nope. Nope. Absolutely not. I mean, it would be a great card to run if it was uh red instead of green. Cause then I could run it in brutaclad and have a counter Ooh, spell. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but no, yeah, this won't be getting no. run. Yeah. I, I've, I figured, I figured as much. All right. Tuck, what's your first hops card? So for my first, for my second, my first hop, um, I kind of chose one that was a little, I, it's a card I really want to like, but I, and I think it's a hop, but it also is like a borderline kind of win con in this deck. It's a weird one. So I thought Rampage of the Clans would be kind of a fun one to try mm. out. So yeah. it's three colorless and a green for an instant, destroy all artifacts and enchantments, for each permanent destroyed this way, its controller creates a 3-3 green centaur creature token. Of course, it can't be a beast, so there you go. Um, there's also some flavor text. Uh, this is going to be a good one. Vicken, 11th Company Battle Mage, or, if you will, Hannibal Lecter. <clears throat> Rage. Rage until the whole world burns, Clarice. <laughs> I don't know how he does that. I got to watch it up again. So... A, I think it's a really strong board wipe, right? Um, the one thing that I always worry about running this card is if you are playing the one person that happens to have a bunch of clues, if you're playing like this deck or something like it, you're kind of hosed. But here, I think the way that we are building it is that you're, we're, I'm going to have a bunch of clue tokens, a bunch of food, maybe a bunch of treasures that are just lying around. So now not only can I completely neuter my opponent's bases, get rid of their propagandas and that sort of stuff, but I will probably have an army at the end of it that's bigger than theirs, right? So... That's why I think this is a cool card. I just think it's kind of fringe for a lot of a lot of the decks that you think should run it. Well, so it's funny. I actually talked about this card on the Commander Smith's podcast when I was on there six months or so ago. And this is actually was one of my specs. I think this is a card that once people start using it, it's going to skyrocket in price. Mm. Because I think what I think what everyone's missing, it's a four mana instant speed, speed yeah. single color so you don't have to worry about it being in two color uh you know having another color that matches one color destroying all of your opponent's yeah. stuff yes you're giving them three three green centaur creature tokens but we do pongify and rapid yeah. hybridization all the time and and i think and the better no parallel there by. the better the better the better parallel there in your defense and to your point is okay this is beast within for one more mana that gets a bunch more targets right and people run beast yep. within in like every deck right yep. it's going to be in this Completely one for agree. sure so that's why for me it's like not only is it efficient but it also can give me that board state that's going to let me push in the damage if my other things don't work out totally understand well hopefully uh you'll actually put it in the deck and we'll see it riggedy riggedy wreck oh yeah oh yeah all right my next card, it is an instant speed, instant. Okay. I'd like to confirm some suspicion. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Confirm suspicion. Uh, three colorless blue, blue. It's an instant. Yeah. It's a rare for a dollar for the promo at 25 cents for the regular. Counter target spell and investigate three times. 
Uh, who who let's, is let's find, let's, let's find this out right here, right now. We have... Bum, 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 bum. Uh, ah, your old pal Slenny. Nope, sorry. Uh, oh, this is an easy one. Teferi, a.k.a. SLJ. Huh. Everyone had something to hide, motherfucker! Yeah! Uh, you yes. know, that was a little bit more Robert Downey Jr. Tropic Thunder. Do we, uh, we'll do go we with it. This, Robert Downey Jr. pretending to do an S. Samuel L. Jackson yes. accent? Yes. Uh, so, once again, I think this feeds into your... You don't mind counter spells and tutors correct you just like them to be a little bit more mana heavy so that way you don't feel like it's just this quick easy you know deck you want exactly work for right it. so once again i'm going to correlate it like i did the other one the other one it's like would you do counter spell plus a colorless and a green to get a creature to get a commander trigger and to have a blocker you said yes here we go are you willing to pay counter spell plus three colorless to get three clues Probably 100 percent. Um, and to that point, when I saw this deck played, the guy needed this. He needed to investigate for his game win con or something. So he countered his own spell with this, just oh, so they could go. get out the three things. And then he ended up winning that game and the one I played against him as well. So yeah, I wow. I think this card again. I probably wouldn't play it in any other deck, but I think in this one, I think it really does a lot of wonders and feeds into all the themes that we're looking for. So. Um, and the last thing I'll say is we're playing Simic, so I will have my ramp package and being able to play this at like the normal time when someone would play Counterspell probably isn't outside the realm of possibilities. All right, Tuck, what's your second card? So this is another one hot off the presses of Modern Horizons 2. It's 10 cents. When I first saw this, I was like, I think this card's really bad. Again, I saw it in person and this card put us in our place. And it's not a snake, but it's a serpent. Uh, and it is the Junk Winder. So five colorless, double blue for a five, six. Affinity for tokens. So this spell costs one less to cast for each token you control. Never seen that before. And then whenever a token... Yes. I'm sorry. We have seen that before, Tuck. The big Tuck card. Right. Oh, yes, you're, of you're, course. I would like to call out that our channel can, was so forget. far ahead of Wizards because we had an affinity for tokens. We also created oh, an affinity yes, for course. Planeswalkers. I'm sure that'll be coming out soon. How did we, so how just did we miss that during spoiler season? We didn't. I mentioned it. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. I was, yeah. I was drunk. Uh, so <laughs> then it says, whenever a token enters the battlefield under your control, tap target non-land permanent opponent controls. It doesn't untap during its opponent's next untap step. So I have, again... This was something where I had this guy on the ropes when I was playing, right? I had this giant army and he just played on his turn. He just tapped everything down and swung in for the win, right? Like I didn't have any blockers to remove that. I didn't have anything. Um, and I think if this just said tap, it would be okay-ish. But the fact that it locks it down, it does like the frost or whatever yep. mechanic that is, I think makes it really, really strong. And to beat, you're gonna, I'm gonna pay two for five six, which in this deck is probably helpful for blocking and that sort of thing. Yeah, I agree. And and once again, I think if you're building this deck the right way, you're not making one token on your turn. Right, you're making right, right. Three, four, five, and being able to lock down three, four, or five permanents until you're basically uh, next turn, that's pretty good. Um, yes. Especially for two mana. For two mana, exactly. All right, what, what is right. your last hop? My, my, my last one's not that exciting. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be honest, but I think you're going to need it based off of the experience I recently had um, trying to activate abilities. You have okay. to be able okay. to protect them. And... Uh, I think you should probably put in Nimble Obstructionist. Ooh, oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, wait, so, did, you, did you come up with I this list after you saw that? <laughs> and you're like, okay, it's uh, well, So I actually have Disallow in my mm. list right now, but um, I have the Nimble Obstructionist in front of me because Tree Folk recommended I need to really consider it for my dungeon deck with Sephiroth. Sure. Uh, so it's like, okay, let, let's let's go ahead and see see what's up. But I think this card will do wonders for what you're trying to do. Nimble Obstructionist, two colorless blue, creature bird, wizard. It's a rare, it's a three wizard one Harry. with flash. Sorry, you missed a little bit there. Flash <laughs> flying, and it has cycling for two colorless and a blue, so you can discard it to draw a card. And when you cycle it, you get to counter target activated or triggered ability you don't control. 
And so I think this will give you a couple modal options. One, do I just want to flash it in as a 3-1 blocker because I'm about to die? Yep. Do I want to flash it in because I'm trying to trick people with the counter spell and get my commander's trigger? Or finally, do I want to cycle it, pitch it to the yard, counter an, an activated or triggered ability? And the reason I think that's going to be big for you is because I was trying to do things a couple 40 life and a dashes ago to where I was activating effects on the board. And I was like, haha, you can't counter me. And then this card screwed me over every oh, time. Oh, sure. And nothing's going to be worse for you if you sack 10 of your clues and like, ha, I'm going to target Mr. Combo because I know he just vampiric tutored and he has a sweet card on top. Up oh, counter spell, you need a way to deal with the activated or triggered counter spell effects, like something ah, like sure. this. So you'll yeah. have your normal counter magic that is in your flavor in your wheelhouse, but you'll at least have something that's on flavor for you, but that can deal with the activated uh, or triggered abilities, because that I think is what will hurt this deck the most. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think the like you said, I think the reason why I'm I'm actually when you first said it, I was like, okay, you're just bringing that up because it happened. But to your point, like, I might just need one more draw, right? I might need one more clue to sacrifice to go do this thing to win the game. So worst case scenario, it's very like a modal card, like you said. I actually was going through my binder today and organizing. I think I have like two copies of this lying around at least. I mean, it's only 19 cents. But yeah, I mean, it, it came in the Commander 20 Precon. So. Exactly, and it's, it's always a better feel for me when you're trying to spec a card that is kind of narrow like this to have a copy of it and just be like, you know what? I'll give it a run. If I don't see it, if I don't have any data, then I'll take it out. But you know, at least yeah. I at least I have one lying around, so I don't have to put it in an order for twenty cents or buy it off eBay for a dollar. Yep, you got it. All right, Tuck, what is your last hop? So this one is a little bit more generic, but it's new, and I don't think we've talked about it. And we talked a lot about. We just literally talked about how the pongifies, the rapid hybridizations, rampages of the clans shouldn't really matter. I think this is one that might start replacing Pongify, at least one Pongify in a lot of my decks. So Resculpt is fresh off the presses, well, was uh, until a, a week went by and then a new set came out from Strixhaven. It's a colorless and a blue for an instant. Exile target artifact or creature. Its controller creates a 4-4 blue and red elemental creature token. And we do have a little bit of voice here. So of course, our favorite family, the Kundros, with their daughter coming in. Like, critics were struck first by the elemental's surprising grace, and then, like, by its fists, smelly cat. So, this one, there is, like, this token sub-theme in here. I don't have a ton of the things. We'll get into one of them later. Uh, but for me, this is so flexible. The fact it's an exile, an artifact, or a creature for one more than a Pongify, it's really more, it reminds me more of like reality shift where it exiles a creature mm -hmm. and then they manifest. So sometimes you can kind of get burned. But for me, if I'm paying two mana and getting rid of their worst artifact or creature, a 4-4 four, four blue and red elemental creature token with no evasion, no protection to me isn't going to do anything so yeah this came in the pre-con that i kind of took apart to help kind of get the idea of this deck and for me it just seems super efficient removal super flexible removal just will do a lot yeah i i like it um you know i i think this is supposed to be quote unquote worse on its face because it's a four four that they get but i'll i'll take giving you an extra power and toughness and spending one extra mana to have the flexibility to also be able to exile artifacts. Yeah. Because, man, a dark steel insert would just yeah. ruin your day. <laughs> any, any dark steel, <laughs> any dark steel varietal. Yeah, they, they all suck. Um, and so, you know, this is definitely something that can help you deal with it. And, you know, it'd be nice if that token could come under your control or if you could figure out a way to take yeah. it so you could continue your token theme. But um, I think there'll be very few drawbacks when you cast this, unless you just got completely blindsided that you're actually going against like a token battle cruiser deck. And it's like, oh, cool. I just gave you a 4-4 beater when I could have just dealt with your 2-2 commander or 1-1 exactly. commander. And then, okay, so check this tech, right? I got nothing on board. Someone swings with their commander without trample. I have nothing but clues. I pay yeah, you to use this on one of your own clues. It, and then I have a 4-4, four, four, maybe more yeah. of them if I have doubling season out, right? Like, yep. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it's cool. Like, I think this is a card. It's 21 cents. It's not going to be any more because it's a common from a new set. But I think this is one that I would think about putting in the rotation. Makes sense. All right, guys. Well, that's going to wrap up hops. 
Now we're going to head over to the convoluted ways that we think this deck can win and yeast. Big Tuck. So I have a single card, a single card, and then a one, two, three, four, five card combo. <laughs> what do you have? So you have seven in total. Okay, I have seven a two card, a three card, and a one card. So we're, we're almost going to go through the same amount. Uh, all right, you go first. All right, cool. So this was this is a combo-ish, um, but it, I really wanted to highlight the first card. So the card that I'm the first card we're going to talk about is the commander of the deck I saw, and that's Adrix and Nev Twin Casters. So this is the new face card from the Quandrix, I guess. That's the one I don't like. So let's just go with Simic, the new Simic thing. So yeah. two colorless uh, and Simic. That's a green and a blue for a legendary creature, Merfolk Wizard Harry. It's a 2 2 with Ward 2. Whenever this creature becomes a target of a spell or ability, an opponent controls, counter it, unless that pair plays two. If one or more tokens be created on your control, twice that many of those tokens are created instead. Kind of like your doubling season on a body, right? So yep. the reason why I don't like this is the commander of this deck, which I kind of gone back and forth on, is it doesn't do anything on its own, right? At least at least with Lawness, it's lower costed. It's not going to be targeted as much. It does stuff when other things are happening. And then it also has the ability. But since I'm generating so many tokens, I think this is still a very, very good inclusion in the 99. 100% completely agree. And I think, Tuck, you need to look at this card similar to the uh, Birthing Pod Simic Commander. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Both of them, the only reason you would run it as the helm of the deck is because you need access to either Birthing Pod or Doubling Season whenever you want. Because, like, it's like, boom, I'm going to win the game as soon as I play it. I think that's why they probably would be the commander for the deck. Yeah, you yeah, put it in the 99 if it's because I don't think this deck is something to where it's like if I play doubling season, I just win. Yeah, it's yeah, just exactly. a really good card. And so that's why I think it's OK to be in the 99. But yeah, totally. you should have this in the deck. The ward two is nice because this will be up for removal <laughs> right. very quick. Uh, so being able to protect it is great. And, you know, just having that extra doubling season is going to go a long way. So the card that I want to pair this one with, and honestly, this card just ravaged us last time I saw it. It's a weird one called Brood Star. B O double D Star. Eight colors, double blue, which seems like a lot, but wait. It's got affinity for artifacts. So it's cost one less to cast for each artifact you control. It also is flying. And then finally, its power and oh. toughness are each equal to the number of artifacts you control. So. When I saw this, again, a dice removal, that's fine. When I saw this, I never saw this go below a 20. It was consistently a 2020 flyer for two mana. It's so why is bonkers. Adrix and this together? You're like because, two card combo? Because this Adrix plays into, this is like one of the cards that are the big payoffs for creating a lot of tokens, right? Okay. This is one of the easier ones in here to talk about. So for me, it pairs well with Adrix because Adrix is going to generate me all that value early on. And then I might be able to get this out on turn four and it's a 2020. Mostly it's because I want to talk about Adrix and this card, but this card by itself is You should have just really had boring. Adrix in the grain section. Yeah, but but those these two cards are way too boring to talk about themselves. So I'd much rather talk about them both now and waste your time. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, but no... I, I like that it does have some form of evasion. That's usually yep. the big negative with these like massive guys. Yeah, the, X, uh, so that, the XXs of the world, or like the star stars of the world, if you will. Yep, yep. Uh, so it's great to see that it has flying. I would actually rather it have flying than trample, to be frank, uh, because yep. there's more, I feel like, death touchy things on the ground than there are in the air. That's mm -hmm. like my yep. Malamo uh, Morrow Sorcerer, the one that we talked about uh, for the deck we're giving away. Um, that one's an XX power and toughness based on the number of lands you control, uh, and it has trample. I would rather have the flying for sure. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but yeah, it being no less than a 2020 is probably great. Uh, you could throw a little grafted exoskeleton on there and then I, really spice I it almost, up. I, I actually was thinking about putting, keeping trying for the hordes in, and I think I just need to stop playing that card. It's just never, it never feels good. It's always like a bad win. We're like, okay, here's this BS card that is $20 that I just happened to strike gold on. So I have them in every single green deck. Uh, yes. So that, and and most most importantly, is just like the fact it's two mana, right? Yeah. Like it, it, that's where that's where you really get the value out of it. All right. So for my first one, I think this thing is a straight gas card. One card. 
One card. It's a green instant. Confront the unknown. One single green, instant speed common for nine cents. Oh. Investigate, then target creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each clue you control. Because it's instant speed, you have right. no restrictions. You just swing, and no one's going to think anything of a single green up. And this is such a fringe card that has no other home. No one's ever heard <laughs> right. of it. Uh, I think this thing... You could do it and probably instant one shot someone immediately. Um, and the other flip side that I know Tuck loves, this could be a politics card. Oh, Ooh. you swung in over there. How about I give your creature plus 20 plus 20? Do it. You sold so, it. So th uh, there is also a little bit of flavor text here. Uh, just a quick line. Let's get you a good one. Have a, I think we have a Thalia, don't we? Uh... I'm pretty sure we do. Hold on. No, we do not yet. Wow, interesting. I All know, right? right? G but give me instead, the you have Satan Centaur Druid, who also needs a lozenge because he sounds like Batman. Never flinch from the truth. Thalia, Guardian of Thraben. Which sounds like something that Batman would say, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, okay, actually, so you know what? No, Batman wouldn't say this. Superman would say it. He'd be like, oh, never flinch from the truth. Batman After would someone be like, like I'll lie to everyone. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to kill you all. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you brought this up because this has been on a lot of the lists I've seen for it. And I thought it was a little bit too fringe. But I think you have a really good point, right? Like, it does what the deck wants. It's going to get you your tokens at worst case scenario, right? Like, I just need to yep. draw a card. Here's one, right? Just to get this thing out. But then having the big swinger for it, uh, yeah. I I want to I want to be able to win through combat, and this is probably one of the more efficient ways to do it in the deck. Yeah, the, the biggest thing that you would want to do, because that's, that's usually the big negative with these cantrippy type things, one-time use. That's why Feather is such a big deal in Boros. You'd probably want to get your E-Wits of the world and just oh, ways sure, to yeah. where if you're using it and you are, in theory, one-shotting people or at least taking them down a lot to be able to reuse it and recycle it. And the great thing, though, is that you're in Simic and green and blue have tons of ways to either repurpose anything from the graveyard or at bare minimum specific instant or sorcery. Totally, totally, totally agree. Yeah, all right. I put I put it on the list. Huzzah! Nailed it. Wait, does that does that mean everything else isn't on the list? This is nonsense. No, I, I am putting them on. I think I had a lot of them on there already. Uh, but yes, no, uh, that doesn't matter. Okay, so here we go. I'm getting into the greasy. I'm getting into the sweaty one a little bit, right? Okay. It's only sweaty because these are three other cards that I wanted to talk about <laughs> that fit the theme of the deck. It's mostly just one card. So the ones I want to talk about are the Academy Manufacturer, right? The one that generates your tokens. And the most efficient blank card, in my opinion, in the deck is Thassa Deep Dwelling. So three colors mm. in blue for legendary creature, legendary enchantment creature god. It's got indestructible. As long as your devotion to blue is less than five, it's not a creature. At the beginning of your end step, exile up to one other target creature you control. Then return to the battlefield under your control, three colorless, and then a blue tap another target creature. So if you have uh, Lawness on the board, Academy Manufacturer is probably the best target, or I mean, it doesn't really matter, I suppose, but I like it as a target just so that you can blink it and then you get three for one and out of anything else. But the real winner, winner that we want here, here. Yeah. Yeah. The real winner card, and this is the best card in the deck. Uh, it's the reason why I think a lot of people are building this deck, and it's certainly the one I'm most excited to play, is our old pal, fresh off the presses of Modern Horizons 2, Rise and Shine. Colorless in a blue. Target non-artifact creature you control becomes a 0-1 artifact creature. Put 4-1-1 counters on each artifact that became a creature this way. Not that great, but wait. It's also got Overlord. Overlord. Overload. Four colors, double blue. And you replace any target with each. So all those clues I've been generating, all those food tokens I've been sitting around, every single one of them becomes a 4-4 artifact creature. Primed and ready to swing in. So... Between the Academy Manufacturer giving me all these tokens, Thassa Deep Dwelling to bounce him, Tamiyo's Journal to sacrifice clues to go get this guy, and then cast it, this is the one that is, the, in my opinion, the biggest, easiest finisher in the entire deck. You just got to figure out a way to go for it. But luckily, in Edric, I had Mystical Tutor, and I also have the new one that's two colorless and a blue. So we're, it's coming out. I'm going to turn a bunch of clues and tokens and other things into four fours and then bash you in the head with them. 
Now, here's the kicker, though. You'll have to make sure you, they had been on the board for at least a rotation. Correct. Yes. So, because you can't have this big blow up, make a ton of tokens, and then cast this. You can. It's just they'll all have summoning sickness, which would kind of suck. Uh, exactly. We're, we're going to have to talk off cast on how you're doing these, because, like, sure, Thassa deep dwelling in academy manufacturer is like a cool grain combo. Game winner? Get the hell out of here. Rise and I'm Shine is sure as a game winner, but these th you're, these you're, three you're stretching. You are stretching. These, these three, I, I need to stretch. I, got, I told you I got one of those massage guns, and I'm definitely going to have uh, the vet do a, a little number on me today. Hey, but like these three cards in conjunction with each other will build you the winning board state. That's where I'm going with it. Sure. Sure. I got one. The last one. The last one you will love because it's the most straightforward, and I would be shocked if it's not your next one that you're talking about. If it's just one card, uh, it's one card. It's an enchantment, and it's blue. Oh, nope. All right. Well, we're moving on to mechanized production. Ah, Two you son of a bitch! Blue, blue. This is a, this is my spice card. This is my big blowout spice this card. This is not a spice card. If this is a spice card, <laughs> then your entire yeast section is like a spice. A spice. I will, this I is the most straightforward win card you have. So I, don't mechanized disagree, I don't. I don't entirely disagree with that. I'm saying it's like too. It's like too greasy to be a that yeast. Does, in my opinion. That is no. That is not the way that yeast works. You can't manipulate the way that our categories work based on your personal feelings. Like you can't say, "Oh, well, we can't talk about Mana Crypt because it's three hundred dollars." It's like, no, that's completely not the way that this <laughs> I, podcast works. I stand by it. This is this is a no. spice card through. Go no, ahead, it's go not. ahead, go ahead. Mechanized production, two colorless blue, blue enchantment aura. It's a mythic uh, for twenty dollars. Or uh, I know, promo. right? Twelve bucks. Twelve bucks. Okay. Uh, enchant artifact you control at the beginning of your upkeep. Create a token that's a copy of enchanted artifact. Then if you control eight or more artifacts with the same name as one another, it does not have to be the enchanted one, you win the game. And it has flavor text, which I will take on the nose or the well, chin. This is this is an easy one. Also, suck it, Dovin. Nobody likes you, Dovin. Get out of here. Uh, this is, uh, ironically, Dovin being the aristocratic Veldalkin. Uh, this is the mumble coach from Waterboy. Hey, <laughs> Waterboy. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so let me just break this down for the collective and for Big Tuck on why he is literally so wrong. <laughs> a yeast, by definition, is your game winners. How does the deck win the game or close out or accomplish its goal? Literally, he just got done talking about a, a basically a conjurer's closet on a creature, academy manufacturer, and rise and shine rise and shine yes game winner because you're gonna have all of these art you just talked about it oh, i'm gonna have all these clues yeah I'll, I'll smack you in the face with an army well in then the how the hell is mechanized production a spice when you literally just need eight clues and you win the game that makes reason, no damn sense so the reason the reason why i put it in spice is because i will bet dollars to donuts right now i will never win off a of mechanized production this deck that Unless doesn't I, make it spice. That just means your opponents are blowing it up. It just means your opponents are idiots. Then, if you win with this card, I, that's why I put it into spice. That's that. Once again, it doesn't. Oh my god! <laughs> you could be playing against people with precons or brand new mat. You do not base where cards sit in categories because of some hypothetical that your opponents are going to have like <laughs> next level brain, brain stuff. Like you're 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 creating these fictional environments. You're basically uh that damn Ben Stiller movie that I never saw, The Secret Life of like Walter of, Mitty. Of Walter Mitty, where, yeah. Where you're like going off into your own like make believe. That's what you have done. God damn it. I, it were, it's a it's a theory craft. These are all just theories that are running around in my head of how They're this is going to play out. They're all bad. They're bad theories. <laughs> God. Oh. <laughs> All right, fine. What is your last yeast card, you SOB? Uh, this one's the easiest uh, because this card, if, if, again, assuming this card lands. Uh... <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, it's a good one. Uh, this is, I actually am so glad that you tricked me into buying a copy of this many moons ago. It's a card you really like. Uh, so if I get to land Urza Lord High Artificer, wow! I'm probably just gonna win the game. <laughs> so, but wait, wait, no, Tuck, how are you gonna win? You may not even have all these tokens. Yeah, they're gonna, gonna 
They're just gonna counterspell it. It's over. Swords to plowshares. Sorry, buddy boy. I hate you. <laughs> Woo! Uh, yeah. So when Urza Hor Lord High Artificer enters the battlefield, create a zero zero colorless construct artifact creature token. With this creature, it gets plus one plus one for each artifact you control. Someone argue that's gonna win the game for you. Period. <laughs> the Castle Slakes game. Then tap an untapped artifact you control. Add blue. Okay. So all my all my clue tokens just turned into insane mana sinks. And then finally, five colorless, shuffle your library, and exile the top card. Until the end of turn, you may play that card without paying its mana cost. Ironically, in this deck, that's usually the thing that people harp on Urza for. I think that's his worst ability, because if I cast something, like, I don't have anything to spin the wheel for. I would just spin the wheel if I had nothing else to do, right? But but the, the whole point in, like, an Urza is that that last effect wins you the game, because you're generating infinite mana. Yeah, right. And, yeah, and so you, make you literally mana. play out your entire deck. Right, so I, I don't know if I'll get there. I mean, I probably could at some point, but anyway, uh, it's a 1-4, and it's now $60 at the cheapest, and I think Mr. Combo tricked me into getting this uh, for my Brea deck when you try to turn it into, you try to tune down my Brea deck, and in fact made it entirely worse with the addition of the companion to it. So uh, this is one I will definitely be playtesting because I, God knows I don't need two copies of this. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think it's, I think it pretty much says it on the nose there, right? Like, it ramps you, it gives you a giant beater. You can bounce it, get more giant speeders, and then eventually, yeah, you can kind of go through your library and just get insane value off it. So in my opinion, this this is one of the one cards that is just going to completely warp the game and, and make this deck extremely good. All right, guys, are you ready? Big Tux this is actually right for once. This is ah! a yeast card, <laughs> and it makes sense in the way that he described it. Literally, if we just remove Adrix, Thassa, and Academy Manufacturing, just have it be Broodstar, Rise and Shine, Urza, Tuck did his job you're, for you're okay the collective. That. Yeah, that well, is fine. Okay, well, so off, off, we were, so we did this once before with Wizard Harry's, and I just thought it was going to be very streamlined, and then Mr. Combo blindsides me with these, like, Four card infinite combos that aren't even dealing with wizards, Harry's, in the way that we were supposed to. So I was like, if I don't come in with like multiple cards here, I'm gonna get yelled at. Then it turns out when I do that, I get yelled at anyway. That's fair. That's fair. It's a real, it's a real win-win for big so, talk out here in Charlotte. So Urza is absolutely fantastic. Uh, completely yeah. makes sense in the deck. It, it feeds into the artifact theme a little bit. Now the clues actually have a purpose because yes. I think. The, the the two sack draw is to me desperate because there's more efficient ways in these colors to draw it's cards. Not, yes, I, I would I would agree. Like it's better. Th I think it's better than it reads. But I agree, right? Like I want my clues around to do stuff like Broodstar and whatnot, right? And you have ways to make food tokens, which you're never going to crack unless you no. just need the three life. So now you're turning kind of two thirds of the uh, non creature tokens into mana rocks, and that is great. Because there could probably be some weird infinite, not like combos where it's like, I just win the game, but where you can like get a ton of value by like, hey, right. I'm going to tap these guys, float this mana, I'm going to put it here, I can now make more tokens, this is going to bring in additional, I can now tap these. And this I think there, there could be some cool ways where it's like, I can't win, but I'm going to make 150 clues. Right. I agree. And like, this is like... I think Unwinding Clock would be okay in this deck. It'd be really good with Urza, but I hate putting in one card because, like, I don't, I don't care if my clues are untapped ninety yeah. percent of the time, right? Like, I only care if I have Urza, and I don't like to do that. But again, like, this is the one card that came to mind where I was like, this could be a huge, huge swing and get this card, get this deck somewhere where it can win. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All right, Tuck, you ready? <sighs> this is okay, so how before you go into this. Before you go into this, what five card? Uh, one, two, three, uh, four, five. Technically, it's a six card combo because you need your commander. So, does it actually? So, does it actually play into the themes of the deck that we've been discussing? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay. I'm ready. All right. So loosen it up. Yeah. Shake it out. First thing you need is you need a mana rock on the battlefield and a mana rock in hand. Okay. Okay. Uh, both of the mana rocks have to be uh, ones that can enter the battlefield untapped, and they need to be able to produce blue mana. Okay? Okay. All right. Those are two cards. Those are two of the cards. Yes, those. that's two of the combo, and you need your commander on the battlefield. Here is what we do. Master Transmuter, three colorless blue, artifact creature, human artificer. It's a one-two. 
a blue tap or turn an artifact you control to its owner's hand, you may put an artifact card from your hand onto the battlefield. So okay. you're gonna and be we do, we do, we're going to be swapping the the artifacts, the mana rocks. It, and this is the uh, Nissa Ravine. There is some there is some text on this card. Nissa Ravine, the goth girl who loves unicorns for some reason. Wasted potential surrounds us with rainbows. Lend me the bobbling blood and let me see what unicorn poop it can be made to be. Okay. Uh, so this is this is the fourth card of the combo. Okay. The next card is going to be March of the Machines. Ooh. Green colorless blue enchantment rare. Each non-creature artifact is an artifact creature with power and toughness, each equal to its converted mana cost. And then the final nail in the coffin. Now, okay. throughout all of this, Master Transmuter does need to not have summoning sickness. You, you have you have to okay. be able to use her effect. Intruder alarm. Two colorless I blue. Knew it. I was just, Enchantment. I was just rare. Say that. I was just Creatures say don't that. Like untap least... during their controller's <laughs> untap steps. Whenever a creature comes into play, untap all creatures. And yes, stick it with me. I do have text I have to read. I I can't I can't I'm so, I literally I got too thrown off with spinning the wheel to be like I get if intruder alarms in here I'm quitting the podcast. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. It's in the it's it's it was in the bottom of my stomach. I knew it. All right. So Admiral Beckett, Beckett Brass, Lord of Darkness, Tim Curry is the devil. Uh, I don't know what that sounds like. I've never seen that. Remember, it's just like low and be like, oh, oh, I'm British. One footstep among many is silent. One footstep alone is deafening. So hear me Unre out. Uh, unreal. Uh, you hear couldn't help me yourself. Out. You couldn't help hear yourself. Hear me out. Uh, what I did is I literally typed in infinite <laughs> combo uh, Lotus, <laughs> and it's like, how the hell can I do this? And I actually think this is a pretty cool infinite combo. And okay. it's nice because you could take it in any direction you want to go. So basically what you end up doing is you actually end up generating infinite uh, clues because the mana rocks will come in that as a creature, so that creates a clue, and then you tap your master transmuter for a blue with that mana rock. The mana rock goes back to hand. You put the other mana rock out, which enters as a creature, which untaps master transmuter, and it'll also untap your commander, making another clue, and then you can literally just continue those mana rocks bouncing each other to make infinite clues and infinite creature untaps. So there's a couple ways that you can win. The first one is if you have your commander on the battlefield, you could literally play all of your opponent's libraries because you have infinite clues. Just I'm going to get your entire deck. Um, okay. The, the second way that you could win is to your Urza. If you have Urza out, you could play your entire deck Dark because deck. now okay. you would have infinite mana kind of. Um, so that that's those are a couple ways that you can do it. But you could take it into other directions. You could say, hey, I'm going to do this and I want to get a hundred clues and I'm going to use that to bash your face in with the four plus one plus one counters. I, I think the biggest thing is that this will give you the ability. And the cool thing about this tuck, you could even power it down if you wanted and cut out the intruder alarm and just keep the, the March of the machines and the master transmuter and the mana rocks and be like, Hey, every other turn, I'm going to swap these mana rocks and make a clue, which is going to make me this other stuff. I don't want to go infinite. Mm. So maybe I just leave intruder alarm out. But I think we talked about it in the beginning. This looks like a very just value town commander. Correct. Yes. I think as you build this deck, I think you should put this combo in minus intruder alarm. And then if for some reason you play test and you're like, I have zero flipping way to win other than triumph of the hordes, then I think you put it in there. So because I think there's nothing wrong with having one card in your commander deck that can help that just wins the game. There's nothing we don't make right, fun yeah. of people for running exsanguinate. You know, sure, it's like, yeah, hey, yeah. Do you need to exsanguinate for 50? I get it. Game's gotta end. I think it's fine, especially that it takes six cards to make this happen, including one of them being in your hand. I, th right, I think yeah. you could do it. I like the master transmuter. I'm just a little the only thing I don't love in here is the March of the Machines bit, because then all my clues just die immediately if I don't have some way to go with them because they're just turned into zero zeros. But at the same point, I could just bounce this at some points and then have like this giant army to then rise and shine or like there's a lot of different ways to go about it. I it's sweaty. I'm, I am glad that you finally found a way to put intruder alarm into here as well. Uh, and it, actually Tuck, I actually hold on. I don't think it works. 
Because, well, I mean, you get your infinite ETBs. Oh, Alter of the Brood, seven card combo. Let's oh, go. There, you go. there yeah, we go. Just infinite be because, infinite yeah, ETBs. Yeah. yeah, you won't be able to play all of your opponent's decks because the clues will instantly die as soon as they're created before any of the stuff. It happens like on layer six or layer seven. Or, yeah, right. Um, so you would need to have a something where it's like when a non or whenever a creature in this battlefield gets a plus one counter something like that or, or you do the thing you do it with um do you sacrifice them you sacrifice them right or they get destroyed if they're zero zero well so if they're zero zero state-based effects take place just like with elish nord with the minus two minus two to where you don't even have a chance to sacrifice them they're just dead but you could if you're untapping your commander couldn't you tap her no because it's like one by one right yeah yeah, because you, each each one is its own loop, and as soon as the token hits the battlefield, it immediately goes away. There is no let me try to sacrifice it because it is that base state action. But whatever with Urza, the judges with, call with with Urza, if Urza's out, you do generate infinite mana. No, because you wouldn't even have a way to tap it. Because it comes in, but it comes if because Urza, you can tap the other artifact, right? It's still an artifact if it's not a creature. So it comes in, you tap it, then it dies. You wouldn't be able to tap it though because it's a zero zero when it hits the battlefield. So there's not a chance to respond to do anything. Mm. Literally, just think about it. It's showing, it's entering as a zero, and it just immediately goes to the graveyard. It's gone. Yeah. So and now I could be wrong. Someone in the collective, please let me know. But yeah, I'm pretty someone, sure if a, someone who cares. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure if a creature enters the battlefield as a zero zero, it immediately is in the graveyard and there is no response time with it. But I could be wrong. But you would get ET, infinite ETBs. There could be BBs. ways to do infinite mana, depending if you do like a, a gilded lotus, those types of mana rocks that produce more than one. So there's still a lot of stuff you can do with it. But yeah, I think this is a very, very sweaty combo. Yes, and even now, is. we're having to figure out how to make it work. Now it's turning into yeah, like, a wait. seven or eight or nine card. And see, that's your up your alley. You love ridiculous, drawn out combos that no one sees coming. What? Hey, what? Okay, so I, I, I don't like saying this for two reasons. One is because you're going to get a lot of joy out of it. And second, it's because I hate even saying this. I honestly don't think Alter the Brood is that bad in here. <laughs> <laughs> Get it. Because it's permanent, right? Like when a yep. permanent enters your battlefield. So every single time you investigate, someone mills. Yep. And it's an artifact you can go tutor for. Ugh. I feel sick. Ah, <laughs> you love it. You love it. Well, guys, that's going to wrap up the yeast section. And then we're going to have under the spice. We already know what Tux is. Uh, a mechanized. real spice card. No, it is not. Uh, that is flipping <laughs> false. So... Um, Tuck, is there any more you wanted to talk about mechanized production? Okay, so I put this one into the spice, even though I don't think it very much is a spice. I most I more put it in here because I wanted your opinion on it and just see if it's worth the squeeze. You and everything into it. Okay? You heard me. It's absolutely worth. It's a yeast card. Wait, what? Oh, mechanized production? Yeah. No, no, I didn't. I I put that one in later because I forgot. I wanted to put that in. I wanted to talk about that today. I couldn't figure out where to put oh, it. So, so you I put it in actually the spice have a spice card, a real one? No, I had one, and then I took it out for mechanized production because of the things of the things I said before that we don't need to rehash. So I put this one in here because I would put this in as a spice card because it doesn't really like. I don't know if it's worth it. So one that I'm interested in hearing your opinion on is Shimmer Dragon. So four colorless, double blue for a five, six flyer. As long as you control four more artifacts, Shimmer Dragon has Hexproof. Tap two untapped artifacts you control and draw a card. And I'll be a good friend. We have, uh, there is some, uh, there is some flavor text here. And it's read by a very timely one, Koth, the high vo voice Jack Canadian from Grown Up. So, hey, it's just down from Saskatchewan. Oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> no, it's way higher than that. <clears throat> Hey, what's going on, ladies? Yeah. Hey, hey, lady. Hey, hey, ladies. I'm down here from Saskatchewan, yeah? The indigo dragon gladly traded a bit of its horde for its everlasting moonlight, eh? Good God. So that's uh, this, do you, so I, every list I looked at, including the, the primers, I read a thing on Star City Games. I read like a bunch of different stuff. And this was like, all, people were saying that this is like one of the better cards in the deck. I still will want to try it. I'm just worried that it doesn't really it sure it draws you cards, 
but that's kind of it. It's a five, six flyer beyond that. It doesn't really win you the game in the same way that like junk winder or brood starred would. And I, I just wanted to hear your opinion on it. Is like, is it worth it just to get that incidental card draw with all the artifact tokens that I should be making? So I'll say, I'll, I'll give you two points. I'll give you the tuck side that you always try to argue with me on. And then I will uh, give you mine. Uh, the tuck side of the argument, the card's almost $7. This is not worth $7. That's uh, that that was I, I forgot to mention that. And that does I think that does play into it in yeah. terms of buying this or not. Right. So you always try to say that like cards money value depends if it should be in a deck or not. I completely disagree with that because that's uh, that's not the way to look at it. So if we look at it from your perspective, not worth seven bucks. This is probably a two dollar card, maybe dollar yeah. fifty um, from a Mr. Combo perspective. When I just look at the deck, I think you need to play the deck without this card first and actually mm. see how many artifacts you end up having and at what stage in the game you are with that. Because this seems like a card that is a 100% slam dunk. If you end up stalling out and you just have like 10 or 15 clues and you're like, and ah, nothing to do with them, right? I got, yeah. I got nothing. I just keep getting more stuff to get more clues. And like I've spun the wheel a couple times and done it to an opponent and I'm not really getting anything from them either. So this would be the best grain card in your deck to get you out of that mid-game hump that you might mm, be in. Mm -hmm. But if you find out by the time you do have a bunch of clues, you're just about to win the game, then I think this is not worth being in the deck. So I actually think okay. you play it with play the deck without this card, see where you where your like dirtle point is in two, three, four different games, and then you kind of make that decision. Yep. Mr. Combo was right. I always end up getting to a point where I have at least eight clues, literally nothing to do with it. Nothing then just to do. spend yeah. all my mana to sacrifice them to hopefully draw something. Shimmer Dragon would be the perfect card for this. Or you might find out, honestly, I always have stuff to do. Um, yeah. Spending six mana for a potential card draw is probably not worth it. Is not worth it, yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's why, so you would agree, though, that this is an actual spice card, quote unquote. Yes, that is a real spice card, not that other bullshit you were trying to push on me. All right, oh, this is a true spice card also, because I, I think it's powerful, but I think it's going to get blown up immediately, and I put it in spice because I don't know how it's actually gonna work with your commander, and I wanted to just like talk it out loud with you. Okay. Rings of Bright Earth. Interesting, okay. So three colorless artifact, uh, it's a rare. Uh, you can get one actually for under five bucks, that's not bad. Um, yeah, and I think I have at least one of them just lying around. Whenever you activate an ability, which would be your commander's effect and a lot of the others, if it isn't a mana ability, you may pay two colorless. If you do copy it, and you may choose new targets for the copy. Um, and I do have some text. Yes, to close to close out the uh, to close out the quotes bit, we have our pal Ashiok as a choir boy. I think this is. I think there's a lot to work with here. Without flame, there would be no iron tools, no cooked meals, no purge of old growth to make room for no bright earth creed. Very good. Very. I was, exactly trying to, I, was hoping that'd pay I, I was trying to go with like a little like Nightmare Before Christmas where it's like dun 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 dun. dun yeah, dun, right. Dun, that Danny Elfman score. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Very, very, very Andrew Lloyd Webber of you. So okay, so this is going to be well. Actually, you know what? I think it's spice no matter what, regardless of what you tell me. So I believe that if you activate your commander, you sacrifice your eight clues. Let's just use that for the number. So you get to look at target opponents, uh, top eight, and cast something eight or less. If you pay the two, you should get to choose another opponent and still get the eight, correct? Because I know with Rings of Bright Earth, you don't have to pay the activation cost again. Uh, whatever that whatever that cost was, you just get whatever the ability is. And I'm pretty sure if if someone was to copy an exp or a copy a exsanguinate for X equals ten, oh, I'm going to copy it or twin cast it, for example. I also get a uh, exsanguinate for ten. Yes, uh, I agree, and I believe the way it works is that since you're copying the ability, it goes on as target opponent. So potentially you could choose a different one. Yep. And so the, yes, okay. So I think that's a fun effect. Now we have talked through. We're going to be adding an Urza into the deck, which that has an activated ability, so that gives Rings another very target. Good, yep. 
But to your point earlier, Tuck, you're talking about unwinding clock. Like, man, I don't want it for just like Urza. Like that's right. Yeah. That's not, and, and that's why I have rings here because I don't know how many activated abilities you're going to have that you truly want to copy. So, but I think it's powerful enough. And if you already have a copy, it's worth testing because yeah. this is really good. Now it's still going to be random. So that's why once again, I still keep it a spice. You have no clue what your opponent's libraries have. Um, but that could do a lot And hell. I mean, if you end up activating Urza's effect, paying two and getting to shuffle your library, get a random card twice. That is also twice. pretty good. Yeah, and I think I think to your point, if I play this, I think this is definitely one to put in, or maybe put it with like the Shimmerween Dragon or the Shimmer Dragon, where it's like, if I realize like, oh, I'm actually doing Lawness's ability as much as I can, right? Yep. And like that's how I'm winning games, that's how I'm getting value out of it. Then, and if that's the case, then this is a really good card in there, right? Um, I I do think that you're right, where it's like, if we're playing Lawness as effectively a commander to generate tokens yep. and then the other one is just like a nice to have right something to do mm -hmm. then this probably isn't isn't as effective yep uh, but yeah i do agree that this is probably this is of the three spices we've talked about uh mine's definitely the most spice of all time but <laughs> if, <laughs> but this is the most true spice right because a it's still random no matter what you do right yep. it does kind of feed into the commander i think it really boils down to where it's like if I play it and I'm like, oh, I'm doing the commander, then I also put in things like thousand year elixir and things to be able to do that several times a turn and then add this in, right? Where it's like, okay, actually I only need four clues. I have eight clues. I want to be able to do her ability twice and copy it each time because that feels good to it as well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like I, I think rings is a very strong card. I agree with you that when people see it come out, they just assume you're doing something degenerate with it. So yeah. they're going to immediately target it. Uh, but yeah, like I like it. And like I said, I have a, I have a one line around I'm looking for a home for it. Probably worth running it, running it out a time or two. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'd give it a shot. But also the coolest thing is I haven't seen your full list. You may end up going through your list like, well, that's an activated ability. That's an activated yep. ability. That's an activated. And it's like, well, damn, I have 10 things in here. I would love to get extra copies of the effects because they're good effects. May not be game winners, but they're good effects. Yeah, right. you know what? I already have it. I, I'll put it in because I have enough things. I should be able to see how it functions in the deck. I mean, hell, I run it in my Arami deck, and I think Arami is the only one I ever try to use it with. And every right. time I do it, it just claps. It just so. it goes it goes bonkers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a really it's a really strong card. So yeah. Also, and pick this up, pick this up while you can. <laughs> yes, it will be a ten dollar card or fifteen dollar card again very soon. And we are at the end of the episode, guys. So as promised, here's some details about CMD Towers giveaway. We're actually giving away the Draft Day Averna deck from episode 101. Uh, so if you're not sure what deck that is, you should definitely go check out that episode on uh, whether it be podcast or on YouTube. Uh, but the other exciting thing is on Tuck. When are you streaming on Bever's channel? Uh, I am doing that, I believe, on the 17th. And he will be playing this deck as one of his two decks for that game. And I will be on Mr. Bever's channel August 31st, also playing this deck. So before the person wins it, you guys will actually get to see this deck in action. And I will tell you, I'm actually a little excited to play it. I think it's going to be fun, um, but I'll be interested to hear what Tuck says after he plays it on Bever's. Yes. To enter, it's very simple. Just promote the content we put out. We're gonna be, uh, you get an interaction for everything you do with us, whether it's a sh retweeting, subscribing, being a patron, they actually get additional entries into the giveaway. Uh, we will announce the winner on MTG Action 4 News September 1st and our social media accounts soon after. And yes, we're gonna be doing these giveaways uh, each month. It depends on what the cast can put together. We would love a five-star review and a subscribe slash follow on whatever platform you're watching or listening to us on. If you have some comments on how we can improve or things that you like, please leave it. And if you'd like to get a hold of us to maybe get a little bit more personal, ooh, on our social media, here's how you could do that. You can reach me at Mr. Commodore 5 on Twitter. I'll spell that except for the five. Big Tuck, where can they reach you? You can reach me at Big Tuck Tweeting. And don't forget that earlier this week, it was actually our old pals. We talked about oh them on God. this podcast. Billy Bob Thornton's birthday. Jesus. You can reach he's, a, he's a great blues musician. Is he? Yeah, I almost, I tried to trick my dad into going seeing him. He's like, big talk, because that's what my dad calls me too. He's like, I'm not going to pay $60 to go see Billy Bob Thornton's band at Knuckleheads. <laughs> 
Oh my goodness. Uh, believe it or not, The Godfather is taking me to see The Monkees in October. Ooh. I guess that'll be fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, if they're not dead by then. Yeah. I wonder if they're still doing drugs. You would think so, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I think if you do drugs long, like early enough in your life and long enough, you just ha you have to keep doing the drugs or your body will die. So I think they're at that stage. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually reading the uh, biography of Keith Richards written by Keith Richards. And he literally says that in there. He like beat hepatitis B without any medication. Oh, my it's God. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Crack will do that. Uh, you yeah, can reach exactly. our main account at CMD Tower on Twitter as well. We will have this uh, theory craft posted on our website with the accompanying YouTube video at cmdtower.com slash bnbe102. Basically typed in, confront the unknown mechanized production, doubling season tower.com. Squee McGee, if people want to find and get a hold of your Manolith commentary, how would they do that? He can do everything you need from an audio perspective, whether you need to record with your band or have your own podcast edited. Just be sure to hit him up. You could support us, though, uh, if you like the content and you'd like us to continue to improve. I know we just did a massive investment into the channel on a high end computer so we can actually start Twitch streaming, uh, whether that be live games or spell table games. Uh, head over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash CMD Tower. Uh, we have all the different tiers, literally, even if you just join the dollar discord, that helps. Of course, if you can contribute more, we appreciate it. And we will reward you with CMD Tower swag, uh, the RK post tokens we do every few months, just a whole lot of stuff. And you get to interact with an amazing community. Now, if you're already part of the patron and you have maybe a frenemy Dan at your local Ooh. play store or play group, you should get them over to join the collective. Maybe that could turn from a frenemy to a friend with our a real program. enemy. Yeah, yeah, a real enemy. Uh, and, and you'll actually get something. So if they join, have them message us on Patreon, and we will send you some free swag, sign some uh, product for you, whatever you kind of want. We just want to reward you guys for spreading the good word of the collective. Now, if you can't help out from a monthly perspective, but you'd still like to get a hold of some of the swag we talk about, or maybe you see on the streams, head over to our store, cmdtower.com slash merch, redacted bits, stuff in a basement. Uh, but for real, guys, you know, go on there, order uh, whatever you need. Uh, I would say, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do, it is going to be a one-time thing. So if you haven't picked up a CMD Tower playmat yet, I think we're down to our last 20 or 30 out of all the really? ones that we had ordered, yeah. And so if you guys like the, just the simple classic design, be sure to pick it up. And we will have new designs coming out for our playmat. Uh, once we get down to probably the last like 10, uh, we'll start working with uh, Mr. Magoo and Rocketing Moss to figure out what do we want that next playmat to look like. So uh, yeah, get out there, get your friends to buy them up so you guys can get that new design soon. And we, of course, have to do a big shout out to our video editor at underscore T Coats uh, on Twitter. Tyler does a lot of video editing for a lot of the content creators out there. For real, leave comments, subscribe. If there's video projects you'd like him to work on, reach out to him. He'd be more than happy to work with you. Um, this is something that he aspires to do for a career. And, you know, we've all been there where we're kind of learning a craft and, and, and it's just about getting our name out there. Uh, so any support you can give Tyler would, of course, be appreciated. So Big Tuck, theory crafting Lonus Cryptozoologist. I mean, did you, you said you already had a list. How did your list compare with all the cards that we talked about? And do you feel like your deck's direction still going the same way that you thought? Or have we maybe done a pivot? Pivot. Pivot! That's a friend's reference. Jeremy, Jeremy Pivot. Uh, what? Oh, oh, from... Pivot! Uh, pivot! Yeah. <clears throat> what is it? Silicon Valley, right? Yeah. No, friends. Oh, God. Yeah, so I'll go Silicon Valley, a real TV show. Uh, yeah, I liked all of your suggestions. I like that five card greasy AF uh, or sweaty AF combo. It's pretty much on the nose. Uh, I think as we talked about with Averna, investigate is one of those mechanics that has a fair amount of love to it, but not tons. So if you want to go down that route, which I, I think you've definitely convinced me to stick to, because I think a lot of people could just build this as like a Simic good stuff deck. Yeah. Um, I think I think with the additions that you brought up, I really do want to lean into that investigate mechanic and really play around with that and try to build a deck that's a little bit more unique than just your generic uh, whatever Tatiova or any of those other Simic commanders that have come out in the last two years. 
Yeah, and, you know, I could definitely... So I see more of where the deck can go now that we've talked through it. Um, definitely, like Magda, it, it's one that I think you have to pick a theme that your commander can really support and not yeah, just loosely sure. support because, like, Aristocrats Mono Red or Simic, like... Uh, trying to think of you know like where, where you kind of had like this you know could go three different ways mid-range yeah like right. I, I i think with, sure. with these kind of narrower commanders you have to more lean on one theme and then if you want to have just some sprinkles like you had yeah, the the uh tireless provisioner that doesn't necessarily investigate but it basically fits in because kind of your overarching theme is artifact tokens you're just going at it with clues so the food tokens and the right, treasure right, right. are still helpful um, and so I think if, as you get it more narrowed down into that, I think you'll start to see clearly, you know, oh, this is how I can at least achieve my goal. I may not win. Like, I definitely have decks that I've built, and I know you have, Tuck, to where we don't expect to win when we sit down at a table. We just expect to do what the deck wants to do. What the deck is and meant then, to hey, be. And if right, we win, yeah. we win. If we lose, we lose. We don't really care. And so I think this could be one of those decks for you. You, you just lean in, kind of like I did with the Seven Dwarves All Permanents. I'm all in yes, on clues. Right, totally. I, I'm gonna win with clues by rook or by crook. Ooh, a good uh, the old fashioned saying, a rare one for you. Thank you, thank you. Well, guys, that wraps up the episode. Get a clue. Mm -hmm.